Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Allison Scobberg here at Consolidated Planning Group. We are super excited to be here with you this Tuesday afternoon over your lunch. Um, today, uh, we are excited to have the law office of Christina Lesher and her uh, team with us today, and they're going to be going over a really important topic, and this is actually one that we have not ever talked about, not any of our educational series. We've never really talked um, deep and wide about this. So um, I'd like to introduce her team. Uh, we have uh, Robert Pierce uh, here, and he is um, her care manager on her team, and we have Mai Tay, and she is a paralegal on her team. So very, very uh, vital imp um, important people um, in, in her group. So we wanted to just introduce them. Uh, again, Allison Scobber, Consolidated Planning Group. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we're really glad you're here. If you're coming back uh, again and uh, you are a serial attender of our um, of our webinars, we're happy to have you back. Um, today's meeting is being recorded. Um, you guys, your cameras are, um, are, are off and you are in a muted mode. Uh, we do want to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so if you will use your chat box today, if you have questions throughout the presentation, I'll be monitoring the chat box and we'll, we, we will again get through as, just as many as we can. Uh, today's webinar is scheduled for an hour, so we will um, be um, done on or before one o'clock. So, um, so you can plan uh, your lunch hour that way as well. Um, so having said that, um, Christina, I'm gonna turn it right on over to you to get started. Well, thank you so much, Allison. And thank you for all the great programming that you guys do. I can tell everybody that we've learned a lot from some of the other programming that Allison, you and your team do. So thank you so much for having us today. Um, this is a very important and personal topic for us. Um, Robert and I actually are siblings, so just so everybody has full disclosure on what's going on and, and the, this, the information I'm about to share with you will have a little bit more context. So um, Robert and I have a medically fragile nephew who is, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, 10, and he is on MDCP. And I want to say it was maybe five years ago, Rob. Yeah, it was about five years ago. My sister um, got a notice in the mail saying that our nephew's services and nursing hours were going to be reduced. And he had been on MDCP since he was born. And we, even though I'm a lawyer and Rob's a care manager, we had to dig in and figure out what are we going to do about this? Um, we were able to successfully reinstate his hours, but it really illustrated to us that getting on Medicaid is just the first step. Maintaining benefits and maintaining your hours and maintaining the services is really um, the hard work that has to continue to be done even after Medicaid benefits are awarded. Um, so we're going to give everybody on the call today some specific takeaways and tips so that if this happens, if you get that annual review and they send you a reduction of services notification, I'm gonna give you a punch list of things to do. All right, Rob, let's go to that next slide. So Rob, I'm gonna let you do um, the first two bullet points and then I'll head up on what to do if this happens. Sure. So a, a lot of what we see when we see service reductions, it, it kind of comes into pretty much basic categories, and that would be you know, loss of hours. And that's either loss of respite hours, caregiving hours, nursing hours, um, you know, any kind of any, anything like that that you get for in your in your plan of care. Um, also would be the uh, denial or reduction of services. So not covering a medication, not covering a physical therapy, durable medical equipment, supplies, um, issues like that also come up. Um, well, we see that a lot, especially as, as children grow in age. Um, and all these things really usually happen during either um, the, the annual assessment or when you're applying for benefits initially. Um, so those are the major really kind of stress times for families when you're talking about um, uh, the changes in your plan of care or your programming or, or what are your benefits that you're receiving from, from Medicaid. And so for the families that are hearing us today, and I've, I'm 
able to see a little bit of the chat box is one of the um, questions that I think has popped up is, are we going to get a specific list? We didn't have a, a, a like a specific checklist, but here's one of the things everybody needs to know. If you get a reduction of services notice, because if Medicaid decides they want to reduce your nursing hours, your pass ab hours, not cover a medication, they are required to give you notice in writing. Once you receive that notice, don't just leave it on the coffee table, don't wanna address it. Immediately, you need to file what we call a continuation of benefits. It does not have to be a fancy letter. It's just, for example, when we had my nephew, we said, dear Medicaid, we've received notice that James has a reduction in services. We are requesting an appeal and we also request a continuation of his service benefits. If you do that within 10 days of the notice until the appeal, if it has to go to an appeal is finalized, your child will maintain their Medicaid benefits during that whole time period. So that's very important. When you send it, you are gonna to wanna to send it by fax, get the confirmation page, and also send it by CMRRR. That's the um, certified mail return receipt requested. It does not have to be a fancy letter. You just wanna request an appeal and request a continuation of service benefits. The tricky thing about Medicaid is when they send you a notice of reduction or denial, they may send the notice and you may not get it until eight days after they send it. Read the letter carefully to determine when that 10 days is up. I would do it the very same day you receive it. If you receive it close to or after the 10 day period, which is on the letter, immediately call Medicaid and tell them I did not have my 10 day notice, then also include that information in your request for continuation of services. A side note, this is where making sure Medicaid has your current address is very, very important. So if they send it to the wrong address because you haven't updated the information, then they they may or may not believe that you or give you any wiggle room on this. Um, so one of the questions I had was about the certified mail. That is snail mail with a certified green card. So it's like an old school letter, which we used to write and type up paper. You type it up, you take it to the post office, and then you say you want it, right? You want it sent certified mail return receipt requested. And then you will also send it by fax, old school style fax. Don't try to do it online. I, I don't know if you can, maybe through my uh, Texas Public Benefits, maybe you could, I don't recommend that here. I would do fax, go to Kinko's, FedEx, get that fax confirmation page back and send it certified mail return receipt requested. Okay, um, and I'm hoping that was a clarification. I'm trying to look at the chat. Christina, yeah, and I'll, I'll watch that chat for okay. you. Um, <clears throat> on the, um, what, so what if I missed that? What if I missed the 10 days? What if I didn't know? What if I was overwhelmed with what we were dealing with and I, I missed that, that 10 day? So are you going to talk about that or can you tell us what to do? What, what is our, what, how do we back up and punt yeah. if we miss so that deadline? I'm going to tell you, it, it's just going to depend on who gets that letter. They are required by notice to give you, to, to, you're supposed to have 10 days to request this. Sometimes you can get a sympathetic ear at Medicaid and sometimes they won't care. But I would definitely, in my continuation of benefits, say we were at the hospital, we were unable to receive our mail, we were out of town. But I would hope that it's better to prevent this than have to fix it. So you can ask, say, listen, I want a continuation of benefits. We, as soon as we knew about it, we sent in this information and we requested it as soon as we knew about it. But you are really gonna roll the dice to see if Medicaid will say yes or not. So I think you really have to be very proactive at reading that mail, which is terrible and frustrating and so scary. But parents, 
If your kid gets a letter that says there's a reduction of benefits, take a deep breath, send them a letter. Um, Maite, can we do a sample letter that we can send to Allison and she can yes. shoot? So we'll, we we'll send we'll everybody. That out. So yeah, we'll send you guys a sample letter um, and then Allison can email everybody. But I would definitely make sure if you're out of town and you have a kiddo on Medicaid, you need someone checking your mail. Someone asked what a TWA 10, uh, 210 is when a parent received the letter from Medicaid benefits. Are they speaking about a specific form? I, it must be TWA 210. I personally am not familiar with that. TWA, can I have my tape? I don't necessarily recall every form by number. So um, what I would ask is I'm going to let my tape do a quick research. Okay, perfect. On the forms and then we'll swing back. And then the only other question that we have for, for right now is like, how do things change? So if we're under 18 and then we cross over the 18 bridge, um, are there some expectations that we should know or should we are actions that should be taken um, at that time of, of transitioning um, and, and turning 18? Yes. But can I answer that question when I get yes. to a different slide? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because it's a great question. And I have a slide that kind of talks about it, so. Perfect. Okay, Rob, anything else on this? Um, okay, mm. so they're talking about, you can also call your managed care directly for continuation of benefits. I have never done that personally. Um, whoever just typed that up, that is right. Um, my only Maybe. thing is I'd, I'd want the proof in my hands that the, that the continuation had been submitted. Yeah. Just for my reassurance, that is something you can do is go through the MCO, um, but you won't have that uh, piece of paper in your hand saying that you requested yeah, it. Yeah, I personally, I'm a control, <laughs> controlling person. So um, how I practice law is what I would tell my sister for my nephew. I would not trust an, an insurance company to do anything. Sorry. All right. Okay, Rob, I'm gonna let you do this. This is this is Rob's sure. wheelhouse. So <laughs> this is really the crux of where we see things kind of go off, off the rails. Um, we see all the mistakes, the misinformation, not enough information. Um, this is the time where it affects your budget for the entire year or what you're gonna get from Medicaid. And it's the time to be kind of hyper aware and do a lot of due diligence. Um, and this is always comes up during your either your initial or your yearly assessment. And depending on what program you go, it's usually through an MCO that's going to come uh, do the assessment. Uh, Rob, for the for the families, just to interrupt for the families that may not know what an MCO is. Can you just kind of give them a brief overview, of like managed care, Medicaid, just like an elevator? Sure. So uh, the, actually. The, can we even back up a little bit further for families that may have Medicaid and they never did an assessment? Maybe their kid didn't need services. They qualified for Medicaid, but maybe they, they're... Can we talk a little bit more about some of that as well? Sure. So um, really, uh, depending uh, for every program, there's going to have to be an assessment. Even if you know they didn't get one initially, um, Medicaid goes through and does the plan of care and the assessments for, for every individual who's receiving services. Um, they usually do an initial and then they do um, it on the anniversary or close to the anniversary of the benefits being granted. Um, these assessments are completed through man the managed care organization. So depending on what county you're in in Texas, uh, there's certain insurance companies who handle the, the kind of boots on the ground stuff for Medicaid. And um, here in Harris uh, for adults, it's um, United Health, Molina and Amerigroup. But depending on, you know, for, for kids, it's also uh, Texas Children's and United, and I can't remember the other one. But there, you know, really that, that goes from county to county because each, you know, each county has, or there's like, there's a map of it that you actually can get online that shows you what are the available MCOs for wherever you're at. Um, the managed care organization, whoever you choose, will send someone out, usually a nurse. Um, the quality of the nurses and the, the quality of the staff kind of vary, you know, not even vary on MCO, but vary from person to person. And this is the time where you, to make things easier on you and your family, 
to have documents and have things ready to, to kind of spoon feed this person about what's going on is going to be the, the best thing to do. Um, you know, I've been to an assessment with an MCO um, here in Houston for a, a child Medicaid, and it was an MDCP program, and the, the nurse came, didn't even have a pack. She, she just showed up um, with her purse and she sat down and started talking to the family. You know, that's, that's the kind of, you know, that's on the low end. Then I've had other times where I've had nurses come in and they, you know, worked in NICUs before and they, you know, have a lot of great experience and they know what it, how much it takes to take care of a, a person with special needs. Um, so really the things we see is like the poor note taking, the examiner's not following along with you. They're, you know, on their cell phone back and forth. Um, we, you know, they're busy, we're busy, but, you know, we want to make sure that they focus on us during that time, especially during this time of COVID when they're just doing Zoom assessments, you know, because Zoom kind of condenses things anyways. You know, we see meetings that usually in person would last two hours, last an hour, hour and a half. So when they're in that, you want to make sure you can get as much information to them as possible, make it easy for them having prepared binders or notes or doctor's notes or things that that's, that's one of the best things to have ready for them. You know, actually kind of get your homework ready. Um, and also double check everything they give you. Don't sign anything before reviewing it. We see that a lot. We see people getting handed blank plans of care. You know, they, the, nurse, the, the nurse from the MCO will just hand them a, a plan of care that has nothing filled out on it. They say, here, sign this. We're gonna, we'll fill it out when we get back. You know, don't don't do that because you don't know what they're going to put on there. And all of a sudden your signature is now on this plan of care that you don't agree to. And that's not going to help you out. Um, Robert, for the families that haven't gone through this process, I know with the people that are on here, some have and some haven't. Some are, you know, they they haven't applied. You know, they don't they don't necessarily qualify. So they're going to be applying soon. Their kid is transitioning. They're turning 18 or whatever. Um, can you talk to what the hope and the expectation is as you're going through this assessment? But I want you to talk, I mean, so we, we know of the families that the, the, the disabilities are super clear. Maybe the child doesn't walk, they don't talk, they have you know a G-tube or a number of different things. But what about uh, an example of a kid that is, is turning 18 and they're going to be applying and going through this process and um, from a functionality perspective, from, from an IQ perspective, they're not IDD, okay? They're actually pretty smart, but they have some physical limitations that need aid. For instance, um, you know, um, maybe they need help getting dressed, but they do pretty well academically, things like that. So what does a family like that, um, what, what should the expectation be? And what about families that have moderate to high functioning autism? that they're dealing with. So can, can we talk about that? Because I think a lot of our audience are, fall into some of those categories. And I, I just wanted to hit on that a little, if that's sure. okay. Rob, can, I, can I jump in on this one? Yeah, of course. Okay. So, and then Rob, will you, will you go to the slide that says, know the medical requirement for your program? And then we're going to, so everyone, we're going to go out of order a little bit, but I think it's a good time. Here's the thing, y'all. There are 109 different Medicaid programs, which is why when your kiddo turns 18 or when you're planning for your child, you're like, which of these 109 programs are we going to be eligible for? And so I listed just a few of these. I, I, I focused on the waiver programs. We could spend three hours just talking about the different medical requirements for each Medicaid program. So if you've got a kiddo that has autism, I would encourage is high functioning. When they turn 18, you know, they qualify for SSI. Maybe they qualify for social security because this, they meet that social security requirement that says they have a um, psychological or physical condition that's expected to last for at least a year and it is it precludes them from having substantial gainful employment. So if you have a high functioning kiddo that's on autism, I would say maybe we look at SSI first 
And then of course, you know, if you have $1 of SSI that qualifies you for Medicaid and within that spectrum of Medicaid services and SSI, there are other programs to help that high functioning kiddo maybe get caregivers with activities of daily living um, and maybe have some assistance with um, therapy, medications and so forth. So the short answer is for, if you have a child that's high functioning autism, I would say look at SSI when you turn 18 and realize that Medicaid under the SSI program can pay for a lot more than doctors. Um, and then once you're on SSI, it also leads you into employment assistance um, and other programs that may be available through SSI. So that's kind of to answer that specific question. And also there's a Medicaid program. I don't have it listed here because like I said, there's 109 Medicaid programs. We could spend days talking about it, but there's something that's called community care for the aged and disabled. And if someone just needs help with their activities of daily living, they can um, have 10 to 15 hours a week of home care for that. And we typically see it with older adults, but we have used it with younger folks who just need maybe like help with like a bathing or a dressing or a prompting. So unfortunately, there's 109 programs for y'all to have to meander through. My suggestion would be a good place to start would be to get a, a diagnosis if you don't have one for your kiddo, because a lot of times families, they're so busy just, you know, living life, they don't may have an updated diagnosis. And then you work with a care manager or you reach out to Disability Rights Texas or some other resource and figure out, this is my kid. What does he or she need? And then figure out based on their care needs, which of these Medicaid programs are going to be um, a, a good fit. And I'm not trying to pitch us again, Allison, but if you want us to come back <laughs> and talk more about transition planning medically for high functioning kiddos with autism, that may be something that we talk about specifically with this program. Some families may not be aware of, that's called community care for the aged and disabled. I'll have my taste in with our little um, other notes and sample letter, I'll have her send you um, a little blurb for everybody. We definitely um, will want to schedule that with you because that is another topic that we haven't done. And because it's emerging and kind of a newer one, um, community first choice is what it, um, and so I think that that would be something that we um, should put out there because um, it is a good option for, for the right, for the right fit. So thank you. Thank you for going deeper on that. I think, you know, when we think about dealing like with SSI, for instance, um, you know, we kind of use the word of they're kind of order takers. So you kind of have to understand or know what you're applying yes. for or what you're doing yes. and what you're asking for. Yes. You have to, you know, learn a little bit more. And if you don't know, um, work with somebody who does. Yes. Um, but but I think my question um, and the reason I was asking that is because if you're um, going down this highway and we've not done this before, um, you know, what is the end, what is it that we're looking for or being clear, I, I think even having a, a clear understanding of what it is that you hope for, you might not get what you hope for, but, um, but if you don't position it right, you're definitely not going to get what you hope for, right, or maybe right. what you even deserve. So I, I think that that was the, kind of the premise behind sure, that. Sure, sure. Okay, good. Okay, Rob, do you mind going back to the little chart here? Let's start with the um, friendly, not friends. Sure. So um, I know that we really depend on the, 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 the people at the managed care organization, at the insurance companies. Um, we really do, you know, they are our lifeline to, the, to these programs. So a lot of times we start, you know, seeing them as, you know, a, a part of our team. And they sort of are part of your team, but they don't work for you. They work for the managed care organization. They work for, for Medicaid. They work so, for the insurance company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they work for the insurance company. So, you know, I always say, and this is, this is something that I always, when I used to run facilities and I, and I ran, and I ran um, assisted living facilities for people with special needs, um, you know, you have to be friendly with people, but you're not friends with them. Okay. You can't be, you, you can't, because you can't have an emotional relationship with them because they're not always going to be on your side. They might not do that. So just give them straight answers. When they're giving you questions, you just give them the, the, the plain facts. 
you know, we this is not the time to play down. This is not the time to make things look worse. You just give them the straight about what's going on. And that's going to make it a lot easier going through it. Um, the other thing I like to touch on real quick is, is um, even having handwritten notes is okay. You don't have to have anything fancy when you're meeting with people. Um, anything that you can do, like if you have to do a time study, you can do it yourself. You don't have to hire somebody. Um, if you have to document about when they go see the doctor, you don't have to have, you know, expansy spreadsheets or, or or notes from TH, you know, from Texas Children's. It helps. And, my, you know, the dashboards make that a lot easier nowadays. But if you just have a little binder that you write things down in, that is OK. Just have some kind of uh, data that you can give them. They're really just looking for that data. They're, they want and that. I think one thing that we really share with families is in, in these types of communications, um, having kind of a good note taking system yourself of who you talked to, what you talked about, what was said, when you fax something in, that kind of detail. So same thing with um, the Social Security Administration, you know, whatever you're dealing with, there is there tends to be a high turnover. Um, uh, of people that you could be working with. And so having that kind of track record, because life gets busy and as the years go by and you have many, many pages of this kind of interaction and communication or they say they didn't get something that you clearly did send and you have proof of it, you know the date that you send it, you've got confirmation. Those types of things are, are helpful just to be able, you don't have to be crazy about it, but just having a working document that you can keep those notes, I think is really important. Oh yeah, Any, anything you can do to, to be able to refer back because if you guys are anything like me, I can't remember what, what I ate you know, two days ago. I'm not gonna remember when I took someone to the doctor's office. So I'm gonna need that to be written down <laughs> so, just to make my life easier. <laughs> also on a, on a real quick point, if you do get a bad person, a bad examiner, a bad nurse to come in, you can request another one. You can ask the MCO to send someone different. If you continually having problems with the end with the managed care organization, you can ask to change the managed care organization to whatever mm -hmm. else is serving there. So and, and so you'll know you have a bad assessment, a nurse assessor, if they come out without a piece of paper, <laughs> if they spend less than 30 minutes with you, mm -hmm. if they don't ask you detailed questions, if they're kind of like, yeah, 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 or if they automatically say, oh, they're not qualified. I don't want someone, if, if you have, so an assessment, and just so we're clear, if you haven't applied for Medicaid, what happens is before Medicaid gives you benefits, they want a nurse to go out to make sure that you meet this medical requirement, which is different for every Medicaid program. And sometimes the nurses that go out are, this is not their, their specialty. So one of the things that our sister has done is she has gotten a copy of the assessment that the MCO is going to use. So before they come out, you may want to ask them for a copy of the assessment that they're going to use and you fill it out for them. And then you just go through it line item by line item. If that nurse is not there for at least two hours, there's a problem. And have your renewal assessment with you when they come to do the renewal, have last year's ready to go and look through it before they show up. I, I think that's really great advice. Um, we work with a lot of people that really do want to be prepared and they don't, I mean, if you've never done this before and you don't know what to expect. So requesting, I love that, re requesting a copy of it. So you know what they're going to be asking. You're already prepared. You've already got your ducks in a row. Yes. So you don't feel like you're on the, yes. on and the hot seat when they're yes. there. And then the, what, what we've seen too, and our sister did this too. My sister, she's, she's super woman, but she will downplay the skilled care that my nephew needs. To this day, she does that. And so we have to be very real with her about what her life is like. So the other thing that we've done, especially if someone applies for a program, let's say you finally come up on that MDCP interest list and they say, oh, you don't have a G-tube or a trach, you're not medically fragile, sorry. There are things that we can do to help establish that medical necessity. And we're going to go over that slide here in just a little bit. So that's why I'm saying it's so important for y'all to do the homework. And if you're, if y'all are willing to do that, you're going to have a, a better, a better outcome. All right, Rob, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, I think this is really kind of a regurgitation, but this is kind of a summary of why people get a denial of services or reduction of benefits. Mike, say, do you have anything you want to add to this? I think the two important things on here is um, the thing about goals, because this is something we've ran into lately. Okay. If you're getting past half hours, you have to make sure you have goals, right, Marty? There needs to be a very clear objective and the way that you're going to fix that in order for them to um, establish the need for that particular area. And y'all tell them what past half hours are. It's, it's like a rehab, um, learn, it's like learning hours. So hours to, to get better at something, not hours to, to get and take care of, but hours to get rehab. Um, one thing too that I'm that I'm seeing like like there's a push pull like when it comes to medical records. So in general, um, the general consensus of human beings is I don't want anything bad in my medical records because that could prevent me from getting insurance or other things in the future if somebody gets my records. But to me, this is the timeline where and and it, so Christina, like you, I, I want to control things when it comes to my kid and when it came to her benefits and, and I requested her records first. I wanted to see what was in there because there's mistakes in medical records. Absolutely. That's all a the, great point, Allison. All yes. the time. Yeah. And so I was able and actually there were some mistakes in my my child's records. And before we went through this process, I worked with her doctor and her doctor corrected them. And it wasn't it wasn't, it was just wrong. It, it just needed to be correct. And so, so this is the, the exact opposite of where you need everything clearly documented in these records. Every ailment, every limitation, every, every diagnosis. Emergency room, every emergency room visit. Mm -hmm. please, everything. It's please. so, think, so important. This is a good takeaway. Make sure every emergency room visit is documented in there. So if you are Texas Children's, but you went to the Methodist ER and you were, and you, you know, cause that's maybe closer where you were, make sure TCH has it in their records. Cause they're only gonna pick up the, maybe the TCH ER, if that's where you went. And usually um, they, and they will go, you know, so we always say having, you know, all the names, address and phone numbers of the PCP and any of the physicians that the families, the child sees, is all good, but typically what they're going after initially is those PCP records. And then they'll reach out, like if we have a strong history with neurology and all the other ones, but but just a quick phone call or an email through my chart or whatever, just saying I'm getting ready to go through this process um, and, and I, they're going to be requesting your records. And I realized I need to see what these records are before, the, um, before they would be sent. I know you get these requests all the time. Can you please, Send me or provide me access of what would be sent for for my son, and yeah. then you can and then you can look at it. And I think I think it's just a good step. It's not. It might be a little over the top. I admit that. Like, um, but because of all the mistakes I've seen over the years in the records, I think it's worth the time to do it. Absolutely. And the other thing I would just like to add for those of you who really like to do the homework, I would get letters from the PCP, the neurologist, and I would write the letter. And you're going to have the letter written based on the medical requirement for that specific Medicaid program. So Rob, we go to the know the medical requirement for the program. So for example, if you're applying for class, you wanna be sure that the doctor, and I would like to have a doctor's letter that says, my patient, John Smith, is a person with an intellectual disability and was disabled for age 22, and his disability affects his ability to function in daily life and then provide examples of that. And then moms and dads and caregivers or grandmas or whoever's on the phone or the call today, you write that letter and then have the doctor review it and sign it. Otherwise the doctor may be like, yes, this person needs Medicaid, thank you. So, and so with the intellectual disabilities, basically what they're referring to, and I just want to kind of chime in on this, is a, an IQ of 70 or below or 75 yes. and below with multiple disabilities. So if you're wondering, like, what is that score? Or what does that look like? 
And the other thing is, is your child might be on the list and their, their IQ may be well above that. They're not in that range. You still want to leave them on the list there. We don't know what the future holds. Or get them reassessed on their IQ. I mean, you may, I mean, the, 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 that testing can be inconsistent. So sure. And, there and, are and this is, you prove this, you prove this at the time that you come up on the list, not the right. time that you go on the exactly. list. So it could be 17 years from now and you're proving, you know, whether or not you qualify for this. So I just wanted people to know that, you know, that, that that's what they're looking at for the, when it, when it says intellectual disability and I, and I see the 75 or less on there with a related condition for each CS. Sure. And I just, there's one little question that just popped up. I know you told me in chat, but you know, I'm a little obsessive about stuff like that. So, um, so they wanted to mention that the parents must participate in the Medicaid annual assessment to maintain or um, to maintain benefit. So if you don't do the annual assessment, Medicaid will stop benefits. Now that the, 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 the caveat to that is right now under the CARES Act, the only way that you can lose Medicaid eligibility, I'm not, you can still get a reduction and you still may not get approved at the initial assessment but you're not going to lose Medicaid benefits under the current CARES Act unless you die, move states, or actively disenroll from the Medicaid program. So um, that may not always be um, the Medicaid policy, but that's just FYI. Um, so Rob, let's go to MDCP. Um, so one little comment about MDCP is that we see a lot of families that are denied at the initial assessment because they may not have a specific medical need that looks like it needs nursing care. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you a story, not a story, but a, a sample. We had an appeal recently that we won where the child contracted bacterial meningitis at age two and now has multiple seizures during the day. Initially, he was denied medical necessity benefits because um, they didn't think he had a skilled need because he didn't have a trike, he didn't have a G2, which is, which is kind of the low hanging fruit way to qualify somebody medically for MDCP. But what we were able to show is he has a seizure program. He cannot communicate if he has a illness as a typical two year old would. So just because they tell you at the initial outset that your child does not meet a medical, doesn't meet Medicaid benefits based on the specific medical requirement, I would say, don't give up the fight. Um, we'll go over a couple more pieces of information for you, but, but the MDCP program for the, those in the audience, this is where we try to prove that this child needs a very high level of Medicaid. He, needs, he or she needs skilled care, but the definition of skilled care um, um, is can be expansive to needing medication reminders, not being able to communicate, um, pain, not being at risk for wandering. Rob, do you wanna throw in any other things I'm missing, the, the samples? For sure, um, you know, um, chronic constipation, um, falls, um, you know, anything that requires somebody to evaluate the patient to make sure they're not any, in any further peril. Um, constipation is big, listen. Constipation is huge. So don't be shy about talking about it. If you're a parent or a guardian or a caregiver, poop should be like a common conversation. It's okay. Because what happens is if you are doing anything to prevent constipation, what you're doing is you're, you're actively providing nursing care to prevent fecal impaction, which can cause sepsis and infection and lots of complicated medical issues. And really, I would say this is also where your doctor's letters come in. A lot of times when it, when it comes to the nursing uh, level of, of need for, for Medicaid, uh, in the doctor's letters, we like them to put if, they, if the patient was not at home receiving this high level of care from their parents, they would need to be in a nursing level of care facility. Uh, and that really kind of sends that, that message home that they, they do need nursing care. 
What do you guys think about, so I know like the Harris Center, um, Texana is another one. These are places where you're getting on these lists, the class lists, and um, the class is the 800 number, but HCS and all these other lists, you go through okay. your your local authority, which again is the Harris Center. It used to be MHMRA. Some mm -hmm. of you only know it as MHMRA and in mm -hmm. Fort Bend, it's, it's Tex, Texana. Um, it, is there, do you recommend or not recommend going through the assessment process through the Harris Center, for instance, to um, kind of, they, I've seen reports that they've put out before of the level of need. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that or any information on that? Um, I like getting involved, getting the local authority involved, especially if we're looking um, at moving, if we're looking at trying to get a, um, uh, a diversion slot because the sooner we can get uh, the the local authority, the, the LUDA involved, the faster that goes. And we're talking, when we say divert, a quick rundown of diversion slot is, is that sometimes we can skip a wait list for a program um, by, by, by saying this person's needs are so high that whenever a, 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 a slot opens up that they can be put ahead of everybody. Um, and the, that's only granted through the local authority. So if we're even thinking about this, we're gonna need the local authority to go ahead and have that assessment done, um, to have paperwork already on this person, because uh, that's just gonna be another step we're gonna to have to do if we're gonna to try to do that, that diversion. And, and um, to piggyback on that, um, the diversion slot, so again, these are, these are dire situations, like an example, um, of, of one that was recently granted was a grandfather who had guardianship of his um, adult grandson who had a mental, you know, schizophrenia, just a, a, a myriad of different things. Um, maybe it sometimes was a threat to himself and others. Uh, grandma died, mom is dead. There's like no help. And he's like in a pinch, like grandpa's in a pinch. It, it, like he's, um, he's, the, the grandson is at risk of being institutionalized and mm -hmm. and 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 if he's mm -hmm. not institutionalized grandpa mm -hmm. needs needs to quit work and he can't afford to quit work so this is an example of a uh, of an emergent you know situation where some t some kind of intervention needed to happen so there's so many different situations um that that are out there but but i i guess i think escalated like it's kind of an escalated thing more so than the, this child is difficult or you know those types of things like I have nobody else or I'm sick myself I'm the only I'm the sole caregiver for this this indiv individual that's disabled and I can no longer even care for myself those types of situations are, are some there's many different kinds but but basically those are the ones where they start thinking about a possibility of a diversion slot and you moving up on the 17 year wait list or however long I've heard yeah, and, longer and, actually and my, my, my thought is even if you are if your kiddo is on Medicaid but it's not providing enough hours or um, for some reason it's not working um, you may want to transition from maybe like an MDCP to HCS. Um, and the reason why we want to go from nursing home to the maybe medically fragile, AKA nursing home Medicaid at home to the HCS, which is home and community services is because as parents on the call may know, HCS also is the funding source for, source for these small group, part one of the funding sources for these small group homes. Mm -hmm. So for our nephew, he is on MDCP. We would like to transition him to HCS because this is what you, I think somebody kind of asked me about this because at age 21, he's going to go, our nephew James will go from MDCP to what we call star plus waiver for adults. And we will typically see a reduction in benefits or hours at that 21 year age when you transition from MDCP, which is the children's medically fragile program to the medically fragile adult program. So if you have a pediatric, you have a kiddo that's under 18, sometimes it's easier for us to do that bypass, even if you're on MDCP to HCS. So we're going to um, try that with my sister. Hopefully she'll cooperate and then we'll let you know. Um, one thing, and I and we're kind of coming around the bend, we're about a quarter till. Um, 
And, and this was a question that popped up in the chat earlier. And this is actually something that we, you know, we hear about on a weekly basis. Um, so what about, so if my child's getting SSI and Medicaid, and then I'm going to retire or, or I become disabled through the Social Security Administration, then my, my child, you know, starts getting 50% of my retirement benefit, essentially. Um, what do I do? What do I do so I don't lose Medicaid? Because yeah. this is um, there's some there's and we talk yeah. about a lot of trust and other things in, in, yeah. in the past. But can you just talk about yeah, that? Absolutely. Like I say, we make a note to do DAC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. You got a kiddo. They were on SSI. You did become disabled. You retire or you die. If you die, excuse me, if you retire or you become disabled and you start pulling social security, your kiddo goes from SSI, which is 700 and change a month to whatever 50% of your work earnings are going to be. What will typically happen is that that increase in social security will bump your kiddo off of SSI, which is a problem because as long as you have $1 of SSI, you apply for Medicaid. Now, there is a program that's called the Disabled Adult Child. How it's supposed to work is that Social Security is supposed to talk to Medicaid and let Medicaid know, yeah, this kiddo, the only reason why they're not eligible for Medicaid is because of the parental earnings, because the parent died, retired, or became disabled. So don't take away Medicaid. There, the system has supposed to have gotten better, but every once in a while, we will still have to reapply for Medicaid. But here's the thing, as long as your kiddo is eligible for Medicaid, and the only reason why they have lost Medicaid is because of this income, meaning their assets are less than $2,000 and their medical needs still meet or that social security requirement, they will not look at the social security that you're giving or that, that they're earning based on your work earnings. But that's called disabled adult children's Medicaid. The way that the regulations work, it should be a smooth transition. That happens about 50% of the time. Okay. So that's the short answer for that. So, so, and then on the waivers, it gets a little bit more complicated because basically if you lose Medicaid, then and you could, you're at risk of losing any waiver if you, if you happen to be one of the lucky ones that's already getting, um, getting a waiver. And isn't it like 130%? I'm, I'm trying to remember if it's like 2330 or I, I forget the number for 2021, but there's like, um, a percentage over that two thousand dollars. So the the bottom line is is the number to remember is two thousand dollars less than two thousand dollars in the individual with yeah. disabilities so name. So there's, yeah. So there's income and there's assets. It sounds like you were talking about the federal poverty income limits, which impact how much income comes in. Two thousand dollars is your bank balance, and the federal poverty income limits will impact the income that comes in. So no, I'm speaking of I am speaking of the assets, but there is a there's a, a separate number that's a, a percentage higher. I'll go back and, and pull that up and I'll put that out in my email. Okay. But there there's a percentage um for the waivers above that two thousand dollars before you lose it, before you before you lose. Hmm. Okay. So I, I'll pull that up and I, I will definitely send that out. It's not much more. It's like okay. you know, it's it's like Less than twenty three hundred. It's yeah. not like it's but a I lot more. Keep it or something. real simple and just do two thousand dollars. Just keep it under two thousand dollars. Just is keep a, it simple. <laughs> it's a good idea. I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you get a loss of benefits, here's your takeaway. Everybody knows you file a continuation of services within ten days. Does everybody on this call silently say yes? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you, Ruth. <laughs> when you get the denial, Medicaid is going to send you a, a letter saying why you're getting a reduction of benefits. This is part of new legislation to make it easier for parents. Sometimes they will embed this reason down on page 299 of a 300 page packet. You have to read every letter, but you want to find out on the discontinuation or reduction or denial, 
the specific reason. We have seen it embedded recently. I'm telling you, it was page 299 out of 300 pages. They said, we didn't know why you went to the emergency room. It, that's why they denied the case. We know you went to the emergency room. We know the treatment you have, but we don't know why. The other reason why we've seen is you didn't send us the exact amount of minutes each attendant was doing work for you. Give Medicaid what they want. This is what I have learned during the Medicaid appeals. I think my client meets all this criteria, all this procedure, all these definitions, regardless of what we send in, they should say yes. Give Medicaid exactly what they ask for. So file that continuation of benefits, complete the appeal, review the service plan line by line. What I do is when I get a denial of benefits or reduction, I look at what the assessment was and I go through and I say, number one, it was, it was marked one, but it should have been marked three. It is that tedious. Mm -hmm. If your headspace is too full to do this, find somebody in your life, whether it's a teenager or a friend and have them help you with this. Otherwise, you are not going to have the emotional ability because you're so busy just taking care of your kids to do this. Um, contact and your I, service provider. And I say don't give up because we yes. see families that are so frustrated by the um, back and forth, whether it's with Medicaid or the Social Security Administration, and then they say, forget it, forget it. I'm just not doing this. I'm over this. And and it's easy to say that. And honestly, I have felt that way myself yes. <laughs> with, with, with my own child. Um, but what I would say is in the end, um, they really may need this. And, and so it's easy to walk away or forget it or set it on the coffee table, not look at it, or just, you know, we're not doing this. But, but, but ultimately, I think it's really important and, it, it, and it, it's if necessary. If you feel that way, then your next step is to call a friend or a family member. Or an attorney. Or an attorney or Disability Rights Texas and know that you are not going to be able to do this by yourself and that's totally okay. Yeah, certainly. I mean, certainly people have been in your in your shoes or, you know, um, Christina and I were talking about earlier about how families feel like everything that they say is loaded, like like no matter what they say, it's wrong. Like they're scared to talk. They're scared to just tell the truth, <laughs> tell the tell the true story. Of, they're scared of what's going to be taken away. And after how many how, however many hours and years and days they've spent dealing with this kind of thing and they finally got it set up. And, and, and there's, you know, they're scared there. There's just, we, I just want to encourage that there's help out there for you um, with this. And if you have felt that way, or you're feeling that way, you're certainly not alone for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so if you have, what we try to do is always prevent an appeal. And we do that by getting a good assessment and by giving Medicaid what they want. A couple of things about the appeal. You should get a copy of everything that Medicaid is going to present at the appeal. We are going to have you request medical records. And here's the thing. You can delay this appeal. This is your kid. They're going to say, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can do that. And they're going to act like it's their own money they're spending on your kid. Here's the thing. You can delay. And the reason why you need to delay is maybe you need doctor's letters. Maybe you need to gather those medical records. Maybe you need to review the medical records. So if you feel like you're not ready, go ahead and delay. If you feel like you need to, please do that. If they won't do it or they've given you enough delays, you can always show up at the hearing and say, dear hearing officer, I know you said we couldn't have another delay, but here's the specific things that I want. You can also ask that the record be kept open to provide additional information. Um, I would suggest when you're preparing for an appeal, and again, this is, I'm going to give you just kind of a thumbnail sketch. Um, make sure you gather everything that Medicaid says that they haven't received or need to qualify you for Medicaid. That, that is give Medicaid what they want. Sometimes if you send this in before the appeal, they may not require an appeal. They may say, okay, we're going to give you what you want. When you prepare the information to Medicaid, do it 
like just like a letter to the hearing officer. You know your kiddo, outline the issues that you've identified in that assessment or the plan of care and provide a reason why Medicaid was wrong and supporting medical documentation. Um, Bob, you wanna go to the hearing? Um, again, we talked about emergency room visits, make sure you've got all the good medical information, letters from the doctors, and make sure that you've got all the information included there um, that will help you win. Okay, at the hearing, and I'm sorry we're going so fast, guys, but I just want to make sure we go through a couple more things. Okay, at the hearing, Bob, we go, okay, the next slide, please. Um, don't have anything scheduled that day. Um, Medicaid will usually, the Medicaid agency will go first. While they're going, if there's anything that's wrong, be sure you write it down. Be sure you show up, call in on time. Um, the only person you have to convince is Medicaid. Use your time wisely, address the issues that are brought up by Medicaid. This is not the time to complain about Medicaid or complain about the caregivers. Try to keep your emotions out. It's very difficult. Don't argue with the hearing off with, with anybody. Just focus on the hearing officer. It's not your job to convince Medicaid. It's your job just to convince the hearing officer. Um, and Medicaid is supposed to provide a response within 90 days. And I would say the, the, the other important thing is that, so the hearing officer a lot of times is looking at the Medicaid policy that the policy has been fallen, has been followed. Um, so you might get a hear a decision that says you, that Medicaid upholds the, the the hearing officer upholds the decision by Medicaid, but you still might get your hours. So you could lose the hearing, but actually get get your hours back, or you know get some of your hours back. Um, so that's that's not uncommon. And then after the hearing, and it's all all records, right? Somebody said PT and OT, basically anything related to the disability, any yes. kind of services that yes. that, uh, that is happening yes. should be pull, documented. Yes, I would pull that IEP if they've got an IEP. Um, any neuropsych testing. Any neuropsych testing, bring it all. For sure. Okay. Good. And if you have a bad, if you get the hearing back, so sometimes we'll have a hearing. And the hearing officer will uphold the judge's decision, but in the same letter, give us what we want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or miraculously, they'll uphold the decision by the Medicaid, and then all of a sudden, a new assessment will be requested. Are all of these hearings um, being held by Zoom right now due to the pandemic, or any of them live in person? They've always been by phone, Okay, which has many issues with it as far as presenting evidence in a clear way visual so of, mm -hmm. yeah so one of the things might say you want to do just a quick summary about all the the documentation prep that you do you could go on i know for hours but can you give like a two minute one minute on how to how to do the paperwork for medicaid appeals so the documentation we usually request so we'll have um open records that we'll request we're requesting everything from the very beginning, the initial assessment, all the way to current. And so there's a specific email that you can use to request all of that information that is uh, within the records of Health and Human Services. There's also um, the Texas Medicaid and Healthcare Partnership that you can request for specific medical documents that they may have. And um, requesting the letters directly from your doctors, um, so going through and making sure that all of the physicians that are listed within that um, fair hearing summary or the assessment that was done, that all of those doctors have provided you with something in writing, giving all of the details that we described earlier. Perfect. Okay. So if you don't get what you want, um, you can resubmit information. Um, you have one year to do that, but you have to show that there's a change in condition or needs. You can request an administrative review. I haven't had a whole lot of success with that. Pretty much they just rubber stamp what the agency said. Um, judicial review, that's you go to Austin and district court. That usually doesn't have a good outcome um request that the hearing be reopened um i'm sorry that should be within 
um, 10, um, excuse me, one year after the final decision, and then maybe a new assessment. So here's what happens. Usually you get the denial of the reduction, excuse me, if you get the reduction of benefits, then you have 10 days to do the continuation of services. By the time we get everything ready, it might be six months, nine months before we actually go to hearing. And so sometimes the annual review or the annual assessment will pop up either during or right after the hearing. So sometimes the way to address an issue is by a new assessment. Um, and then the other tidbit I would add is sometimes the managed care organization or the service provider is the worst person to fix things because a lot of times it's the information they sent in Medicaid that caused this problem. So what we did with a recent case is we reached out to the nurse that does the utilization review at TMHP. That's the governing agency that makes the medical determinations for Medicaid. And we are working on clarifying the documentation that we need to get this young man as many past half hours as we can. So, Rob, you want to add anything to that? Mm, not, no? Nothing that I have. <laughs> but I think um, we work directly with the service coordinator as well with the with the LIDA. Yeah. 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 Directly with, with everyone that's involved within the service plan for... In like, like, you know, there's also some push pull. You might lose some hours in one area, but maybe there's some hours you can make up. Right. In so working with the LIDA in those instances really does help. For sure. Um, well, I've got time. So um, I would like to thank you both, um, all of you for being here today and um, sharing this information. This has been recorded. Um, if you can forward um, to the next slide or two. Um, the, oh, yes. The, is the following things are things that should be on your radar as it relates to um, as it re as it relates to planning. Um, and we have a lot of topics on this. We are going to put this out there on our YouTube channel. So you will be able to get a playback of this um, and you'll get a recording of this later later today. And if you'll just forward to the next slide, um, if Christina and her team can be of assistance to you um, and kind of your journey and what you're dealing with with this, um, certainly do reach out to their law firm. Um, Christina has been around uh, for forever and is very, very well recognized in the special needs community. So um, I, for one, am very thankful um, for the opportunity for you uh, to, to speak to these families today. So thanks for sharing this. This, this oh, thank you, Allison. complicated with all the other moving parts of SSI, SSDI, and all just understanding those different differences. It is all very confusing and we aim to educate and put a lot of information out there so you can navigate some of this uh, yourself. We know it's hard. You're not alone. And um, again, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. And, th and thank you, Christina and team oh, for, for you. all of thank your you. information. Yeah, so, and, pa and parents, guardians, caregivers, y'all can do this. You know your kid and Allison's right. You can do this. It's okay. It's okay. You got it. You've got this and we've got resources to share and information. And so, um, like I said, I'm happy you're here. So oh, thank you. Th thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye now.